All right, let's uh, test this old paper wax capacitor to its rated 400 volts and see how much leakage it has. So we've got about 400 volts being applied to that capacitor. And uh, what we're measuring here is uh, 17 millivolts. And uh, using the conversion of one volt per milliamp, that tells us we've got about 17 or now 16 microamps of leakage. And this capacitor really shouldn't be leaking you know, more than a microamp probably. So it was good that we replaced it. As you can see, in today's video, we're going to talk about capacitor leakage. And I really want to focus a bit on this capacitor leakage tester that I built using a circuit board from the Antique Wireless Association. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by capacitor leakage and how it differs from some of the other failure modes in capacitors. Then we'll take a look at how to use this uh, leakage tester from AWA and then even take a peek inside to see how I built it. So let's get started. So let's first briefly review what leakage is on a capacitor. So I've got effectively an ideal capacitor here, which would be a perfect insulator with two conducting plates on either side. Now the ESR, or the equivalent series resistance, which is often a failure mode in electrolytic capacitors, is not related to leakage at all. But I wanted to point it out here so I could specifically say that it's not related to leakage. So oftentimes you might test a capacitor for ESR to judge whether it's good or not, but that still tells you nothing about the leakage. Leakage is effectively the current that flows through the insulator. Uh, it can be modeled by a resistor in parallel with uh, the capacitor itself. Ideally, a capacitor will block DC entirely and you won't have any DC current flow, but leakage is in fact the DC current flow that does go through a capacitor. Now, contrary to what you might think, there are acceptable limits for DC leakage in a capacitor. We'll talk a little bit about that. Often when you're repairing or restoring vintage electronics, you're often replacing capacitors because they can fail in many ways. You know, they can go open or can, can short out. Or the capacitance value can change. The ESR can creep up, and uh, which is often a problem with uh, dried out electrolytics. And you can get high leakage and those other failure modes as well. And oftentimes you need different testers to check all of them. Just testing for ESR will tell you nothing about leakage, for example. Or just testing the capacitance change or capacitance value might not tell you about leakage. And oftentimes even DMMs will just allow you to test capacitance value as well as, you know, like an LCR meter, you know, like this guy here or this older LCR meter I've got down here. This guy can test for ESR as well, but it's still not going to tell you anything about leakage. I did a video about uh, 10 years ago on this ESR meter that I built, but again, that's not going to tell me about leakage either. Now you can test leakage very simply with you know, a, a, a power supply that reaches the rating vol rated voltage for the capacitor uh, and a, an ammeter and a series current limiting resistor. So it can very simply be done by lashing all that together. But this little tester that I've got from uh, AWA or Antique Wireless Association kind of puts that all into one box, just very convenient. So a little bit more about leakage. It's actually pretty common uh, with older and vintage capacitors uh, such as these old uh, you know, paper wax capacitors like this guy here, this old uh, bumblebee cap, uh, and even uh, the older electrolytic capacitors like this dual section electrolytic. It's pretty common for the leakage to kind of get a bit excessive. Now, aluminum electrolytic and tantalum capacitors will normally have some leakage. In fact, it's actually specified. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, more so than uh, film and mica and ceramic caps, which usually have minimal leakage, usually well under a microamp and something that is oftentimes very difficult to measure. And usually these types of capacitors, these non-polarized capacitors, don't really specify leakage as much as uh, specifying the insulation resistance instead of leakage. And of course, you can, with Ohm's law, figure out what a leakage current would be uh, at a given working voltage. And here's some of the typical leakage specifications for aluminum electrolytic capacitors. And it'll vary by manufacturer, it'll vary by type of the capacitor even within a manufacturer, but it's usually specified as some you know, component as a product of the capacitance and the working voltage. So some of the common specs that we've seen are like three times the square root of the product of capacitance times voltage, or maybe like something like 0.1 times capacitance times voltage plus some fixed value. And we see these in various uh, data sheets. And for all of these, the capacitance is generally given in microfarads. The leakage that you result from computing this is in microamps, um, usually uh, even specified with a dwell time, saying that you're going to measure you know, some leakage value after 
two minutes or after five minutes because you'll find with electrolytic capacitors when you first charge them up the leakage will be higher and as the capacity dielectric reforms itself the leakage actually goes down and uh, the voltage that you stick into these formulas is generally the rated voltage. Now, if you're repairing a piece of equipment, you may be more interested just in what the leakage is at the working voltage that is, that's present in that piece of equipment, so you can certainly test it there. You know, tantalums are similar. They're usually a bit less leaky than the aluminum electrolytics. And again, film caps, they're generally going to specify things in terms of insulation resistance, and some common values are you know, 1 to 30 gig ohms. So again, if you're working even at a couple of hundred volts, that typically is you know, a few microamps or less of leakage current. So, uh, so generally, if you're going to measure several uh, microamps of leakage, that means that the capacitor is probably more leaky than you want. Now here's an example data sheet uh, from Panasonic on uh, one of the lines of their electrolytic capacitors. And we can see there's a spec for leakage current. It's going to be less than or equal to 0 0.06 times capacitance times voltage plus 10 microamps after two minutes of, of applying the rated working voltage at 20 degrees C. Now, as the temperature goes up, the leakage goes up. Um, that some of the data sheets will include some information on that as well. Now, just to show you another variation, here's a, a data sheet from Nichicon for their UVY uh, capacitors. And under leakage current, it's a bit more complex. For rated voltages from 6.3 to 100 volts, uh, they've got one spec and then another spec for the 160 to 450 volt capacitors. For those high voltage capacitors, you have to take a look at what the CV product is. If the capacitance times voltage is less than or equal to 1000, then the leakage current is given by this equation, 0.1 times CV plus 40. If the CV product is greater than 1000, then the leakage current is given by this formula, 0 0.04 times capacitance uh, times voltage plus 100 microamps. So in all these cases, if you work out some of these numbers, you're typically talking about leakage currents for these high voltage electrolytic capacitors in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred microamps. Sometimes, sometimes at the, for the higher value capacitors, it could be closer to a milliamp. But uh, usually you can make a judgment of you know, if a couple of hundred microamps or less is generally going to be within spec. But if you really want to be specific, you almost have to go to the manufacturer's data sheet to see what they specify. Now this leakage tester uh, is again based on a circuit board from the Antique Wireless Association. I'll put a link down below where you can get that. I think they sell the bare board for $25. And then in addition to the board, you get uh, a wiring diagram of how to hook it all together. And then you also get uh, the parts layout diagram, the parts list, and then even a list of all of the components with uh, Mauser part numbers. So you can go ahead and order a complete component kit. Now the way this uh, operates, there's a, a discharge switch that essentially shorts the capacitor out through you know, a medium value resistor to put a safe voltage across the capacitor for connecting and disconnecting it. Uh, it applies a variable DC voltage to the capacitor. I've got that, uh, those connections up here. And then uh, there's monitor points to monitor the voltage across that capacitor. And then there's also a set of monitor points to monitor the voltage across a 1K ohm resistor that is in series with the capacitor and the high voltage power supply. Therefore, you, the voltage that's read here is directly proportional to the leakage current, basically where one volt per milliamp of leakage current. So if you measured one volt with a voltmeter connected here, that means you'd have one milliamp of leakage current. So if you're measuring less than a volt, like in the millivolts, then you're looking at microamps of leakage current. Now when I built this, I just thought it'd be, because we're generally looking at vintage electronics, I thought it'd be kind of cool to monitor the voltage across the DUT with this old vintage voltmeter. So I built that into my version. Uh, it's not something that's uh, specified or put out as part of the, uh, the circuit board's uh, documentation. I just thought it was a neat addition for my build. And when I built mine here, I took care to ensure that anything that can present a high voltage is up on the top panel here. Uh, because if you can connect up a DMM here to measure, to monitor the voltage instead of using this meter, and that could have you know, the high voltage uh, appearing uh, directly there. And of course, the high voltage can appear on these jacks for t testing the capacitor. So I wanted those jacks placed far away from where I'll be operating my hands to operate the tester itself. I will give you this word of caution that the, this device can produce you know, in excess of 400 volts 
to, to go to the capacitor you're testing and therefore to be monitored. And that could certainly be very dangerous to handle, could be fatal if you don't handle it properly. So if you're not comfortable around high voltage, then don't build this. But I just wanted to give you that word of caution because there aren't any safeties or interlocks built into the way this thing works. But I just, for my own safety, wanted to ensure that if I'm going to be flipping the switch and turning this knob, I'm not going to have my hands near where the high voltage connections are. So let's first test this old uh, paper wax capacitor that is uh, rated at 400 volts at uh, 0 0.005 microfarads. Okay, so it's a non-polarized cap, so it doesn't really matter which uh, lead I connect to which side of the capacitor. I'll turn the voltage down to minimum, flip the tester on, and it's on in the discharge position. Uh, I've got uh, DMM uh, connected up to the leakage monitor jacks, so the voltage reading here will be proportional to the leakage current. So I flip over to test. Uh, the tester will put about a minimum of 9.5 to 10 volts across the capacitor. This capacitor is rated for you know, four or 500 volts, so I'm going to bring it up to 400 as a max. So as I start bringing the uh, voltage up, we can actually read the voltage here directly on the meter on the lower scale. So that's about 100 volts there. There's about 200 volts. There's 3, and there's 400 volts. So 400 volts, we're reading about 22 millivolts. So 0 0.02 uh, uh, volts, and at 1 volt per milliamp, that means right now that's showing me 20 microamps of leakage current. Now being a non-polarized, basically a film cap, but it's a paper cap, you really want the leakage of those to probably be, you know, a microamp or a few microamps or less. So we'd consider this probably 60 or 70 year old cap as faulty and replace it with a more modern unit. When you're done testing, uh, we can flip directly to discharge or we can turn the voltage down and then flip to discharge and then uh, disconnect the capacitor and put our next one in place. Next up is this cap, often called a bumblebee cap, is the, the black plastic and the yellow stripes is a, a 0 0.047, I believe, uh, capacitor. And uh, these are typically rated for a couple of hundred volts. I'm only going to bring it up to 300 because I'm not exactly sure where. So I'll flip over to test and again uh, bring our voltage up. I'm going to bring it up to about 300 volts here, and we see about 72, so that's 72 microamps of current. Again, probably at least 10 times more than I probably would want to have on that cap, so that's good that we replace that one as well. Now just to give you an idea of the type of capacitor I'd use to replace those paper caps or that uh, bumblebee cap, here's a uh, film capacitor that's uh, effectively brand new. Let's test this guy up to 400 volts. So we bring this guy up to 400. And we can see we're not reading any current there at all. If we switch over to the millivolt scale, even on the millivolt scale, we're not reading anything at all. And that's really ideally what you want is these non-polarized capacitors are going to leak uh, minimally, uh, if at all. So that's really what you want to see on those non-polarized film caps. Now electrolytic caps are a little bit different. Uh, again, you're going to normally have some leakage just due to the action of the electrolyte that is in them. This is a brand new 10 microfarad, 450 volt capacitor we'll take a look at. And then we'll take a look at this guy here, which is also a brand new, uh, let's see, 400, 470 microfarad, 250 volt cap. Now, of course, these are polarized, so you do want to take care to hook up uh, the right polarity. In the case of the aluminum electrolytics, the negative side is usually one with the stripe, as opposed to tantalums, which usually mark the other way. So we've got that capacitor hooked up. It's rated to 450 volts. We'll test it up to about 400 here. Uh, let's see, we'll flip over to test. Let's bring this all the way up to about 400 volts. And we're seeing the number falling. Uh, it's not falling very quickly, but it is falling. So now we're at 27 microamps, 25, 23, 21. And this is why you'll see in the data sheet sometimes that they'll specify the leakage after two minutes or after five minutes because you have to give time for that electro, uh, the, the dielectric, the electrolyte that's in there to completely reform uh, that dielectric layer. So you'll see that'll continue to fall. So this capacitor, uh, if we ran the numbers on this, I think the acceptable leakage value in this cap, uh, given the manufacturer, was on the order of about uh, 100 microamps or a little less than 100 microamps. So we're well, well under that. Obviously a brand new cap, we would expect that to be good. Now next up is this 470 microfarad, 250 volt rated capacitor. Now as I flip over to the test mode and I start bringing the voltage up, you'll notice that the voltage across the capacitor will ramp up slowly. Even if I 
go very quickly to the 100 volt position, we can see the voltage is ramping up very slowly. We can see, you know, I'm talking about milliamps of current. This tester is designed to provide that voltage to the capacitor through about an 18k ohm resistor. So it's going to charge it relatively slowly. So we're going to see that happening here. The other thing that's happening at the same time is that dielectric layer is reforming. And that's also, as that reforms, the leakage current is going to come down. So we're seeing a combination of charge current and a reducing leakage current. So now I'm at uh, near that 100 volt point. Let's bring it up to 200 volts. Again, watch our meter coming up here. We can see we're up in milliamps of charge current going into the capacitor. As it reaches full charge, then we'll start to level off, but then we'll start seeing some reforming of that dielectric again as well. We go up to about where it would be the 250 volt point and let this thing sit here for a while and we'll come back to the video after it's settled out a little bit. Now this is a Nichicon capacitor and uh, again we look at the, the formula for this particular capacitor. Uh, our CV product is greater than a thousand so we'll use this uh, formula here. So if we run this number of you know, 0.04 times CV plus 100 that says we're allowed to have a leakage current of up to 4.8 milliamps. Okay, now that seems like an awful lot, but it's a large value capacitor. Now I'm sitting here uh, pretty close to the 250 volt mark, and we're looking at about 121 microamps of current. So this capacitor is well within specification. Now, one thing you'll note with these large value capacitors, even when I flip to the discharge position, the voltmeter is still going to measure the voltage across the device. It discharges the capacitor through a 4.7k ohm resistor. So these large value capacitors are going to discharge relatively slowly. But you can watch this meter decide when it kind of gets down to the bottom, when it's safe to then go remove that capacitor and test your next one. So that's basics of how you use this particular tester. Let me show you how I put mine together. Now I had this nice slant top case that turned out to be just the perfect size for this. And again, being that we're testing vintage components and things like that, I thought that the old vintage voltmeter and a big old vintage knob was appropriate for this. So for AC power, I just put in an IAC outlet here on the back. And let's take a look inside. So this is the circuit board that you can get from AWA. Again, I'll provide a link down below and uh, just assembled it with all the through-hole parts. Really easy. It goes together in probably less than an hour. And uh, again, mounted it to this nice case. Uh, I've got the lighted uh, AC switch here, the IAC power entry point right there, and then all of the wiring that I did here, uh, because we can reach you know, voltages in excess of you know, 400 volts here, I made sure that the wiring that we're using here uh, is a nice silicone flexible wire that's rated for like 600 volts or more so that uh, we're not, we're not going to be in danger of shorting anything out to the case and things like that. Uh, but otherwise it went together pretty well and I put enough wire here so I could fold the thing out and do some testing on it before it went together and then it all folds together nicely when it goes back together again. I wanted to give a little shout out to my buddy Bob. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel called Radio Wild. He does a lot of restoration of uh, older radios and he's the one that I, I was able to get these old parts from because anything that I've worked on where I've pulled out some of these old parts I typically throw them away. <laughs> so, uh, And Bob, Bob does a lot more than that, of that than I do. So uh, he was kind enough to, to give me some of his uh, throwaway parts here to go test on this tester. So if you're into uh, restoring uh, vintage radios and old tube type radios definitely check out uh, Radio Wild's YouTube channel also linked down below. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed this video uh, talking about uh, leakage and capacitors and how to test for leakage using this kind of direct method of high voltage application and, and current measurement using this circuit board from AWA. Again, also uh, linked down below. Thanks again as always for watching. If you liked the video, give me a thumbs up. If you hadn't subscribed already, please consider doing so. And thanks again as always for watching.